I'm really humbled uh, to be invited by, uh, obviously, Asian Society to kind of hang out with y'all. And uh, just because so much is happening and there's so many good brains in here, strong brains that uh, are talking about leadership in so many different dynamics in that multifaceted space of what is diversity. And so today I will talk about uh, storytelling, but I want to talk about something that's kind of the obvious thing that's happening right now, uh, especially in my building and other buildings uh, in New York City. Uh, and also here in Silicon Valley and other places. Uh, and I do think, who thinks we're at a watershed moment? Three people? Four? Why do you think we're at a watershed moment? Those who raise your hand. Just scream it out. And let me know. Men are getting fired. Men are getting fired. <laughs> All right. Say it as it is, right? Yeah, what else? What else? Why are we at a watershed moment? Democracy is failing. Okay, that is, I, I don't know if I'll tweet that, but that's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Me too moments, yeah, yeah. You should do a hashtag or something like that, yeah. Anybody else? One more thought, why? Huh? Oh, I thought somebody was saying something, all right. All right great, go. Oh, wow, wow, yeah, exactly. Who was it? Me Too Movement. So our guess was that it was going to be women. Person of the year, women. Um, and I think that's what it is, right? Um, which is, would be fantastic. You know, uh, as we talk about stories on MSNBC of Harvey Weinstein, um, and later on, and we talked about Hollywood, I've done stories about the pay gap when you look at the top stars. And we look at women getting paid half the amount despite grossing equal or more. That certainly was sort of the tip of that huge iceberg that we were talking about with uh, Harvey Weinstein. Um, in my building, we had Matt Lauer. I remember I was in North Carolina and I was turning on the TV, watching the Today Show, because I had a, an event over at uh, Novozymes at that time. And I, who saw that by the way? Who saw it? Who DVR'd it? On demand, okay. So I turned on the TV, <coughs> and I said, oh, there's Hoda filling in for Matt. Matt must be out today. I didn't know that, okay. Uh, <laughs> and I love Hoda, Hoda's like really fantastic. And she's really great, and Savannah reaches over and grabs her hand, I was like, isn't that great? They're just good friends, because they are really good friends. <laughs> so great to see you, Hoda. She says something like that. And then she says, <coughs> Hoda's in today for Matt, and uh, we have an announcement to make. And then she says, Matt Lauer's been fired. I was like, am I awake? <laughs> what happened? Wait, what happened? Um, and like all of you, I learned of that moment. And I, then I learned why. And then the details came out. And so it's been, as you know, at 30 Rock, a discussion everybody has had. But it's also been a discussion of what everybody's had across the country and around the world. Because it was the Today Show. It is sitting on those morning coffee tables. And it's now out in front. That Me Too moment was happening for so many different people. And as many of you know, there's Charlie Rose thereafter, and there, there will be more. Uh, there will be more. We know of some story being worked on right now. And so when that happens, uh, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, we'll have more headlines. And that's certainly applicable to why we're here today, I think. When we think of Silicon Valley, when we think of business, and the, the number that's gotten slightly better over recent years, the number of CEOs, that's just a tip of the iceberg, right, that are women. Um, what's that percentage? 6.4 percent. That's up from 5 percent, by the way, uh, from a couple years ago. That's that's pretty pretty bad. And uh, we know that this is also crossing into politics. I've talked about Al Franken. I've talked about John Conyers. I've talked about Roy Moore. Uh, and we also, of course, have a president that has bragged about sexual assault. All of these messages, I think, are part of what we're at this Me Too moment and what we've had to talk about and what we need to talk about. And it's been part of our discussion in business too, whether it's consulting or on Wall Street. Many of you have stories. Um, many of you have a Me Too moment. And why do I think it's a watershed moment, just to put that out in front, is I think we're in a really special place, not only in terms of awareness, but we think about how the Arab Spring started. We think about how LGBTQ rights is just, duh, like, yeah. And we think about all of the countries that many of you have visited and how they have now taken on 
new leadership, new ideas, some positive, some negative. But the voices of everybody now being heard, sometimes equally, sometimes not equally. And I think that leads to this watershed moment idea of this millennial age that we're living in. Not millennials, but millennial age, which means we're all adopting, whether we're one or 92, that Christmas song is what I'm alluding to, but I anywhere in between, we are living in this time, and I think that now anything, anytime, anywhere, and that's why I think we're at this, potentially this watershed moment, because now guess what is part of that anything, anytime, anywhere? It's the Me Too movement, and it's happening in front of us. And if we look at the uh, impetus of the Arab Spring and the LGBTQ movement, there's others that indicate to us that leadership in diverse ways is coming in so many uh, interesting uh, opportunities and avenues. And that's why I think things like the idea of male privilege is, can be discussed. And male privilege is really weird. Like, I just learned that like a year ago, and I said, yeah, there is this thing called male privilege. And I do walk into a room not knowing that. Any women know about male privilege? <laughs> uh, anybody feel that ever? Um, exactly. So when I was like, I, it took me how many years to figure out that I had male privilege? And this despite talking about you know, gender equality and, and learning about it, because it's not like you turn on a switch and all of a sudden you become uh, somebody who is a feminist. It's a, it's a long journey. It's a long journey. And you take it day by day by day by day. And I know as soon as I turned that on, I was like, wow, I, I don't all of a sudden have this tag on my lapel like a sound of feminist. It's a long journey we learn each and every day. And so if you have the time, there are things like he for she for men and women. Look at that. This is an important time for this campaign. I'm talking with Candy because Twitter is also one of the 10 corporations that signed up for the he for she campaign. Uh, and, and if you think about uh, you know, how you can combat that day by day is to, you know, I, you know, I get asked this very often, so what can I do now to be a he for she or what can I do now to be a feminist? And it is start with very simple things like language. Any of you say, hey, you guys, a lot? <laughs> Don't say, hey, you guys. <laughs> say, hey, you folks. <laughs> hey, y'all. <laughs> For anybody that's you know, from the South. There are a lot of little things we can do, and that's an easy thing to start with, because then it becomes part of the way you operate every day. Hey, y'all, what's up? What y'all plan on doing? I will even say, you guys, and then correct myself. So once it's out of the barn, don't, don't feel like you can't correct yourself. Hey, you guys, I mean folks, that's an absolute, uh, absolutely acceptable. And this idea of uh, intersectionality that Candy brought up, I think in storytelling for me has been, you tell stories of people's differences and you highlight their differences because it makes them beautiful. But then you also have to bring it back and say how we're the same. Because that's why I tell, about, tell stories about how we're different, is that we can show that we're the same. But don't forget to do that when you are telling stories. And so she asked the question, who's African-American in this room? Who is African-American in this room? Can you stand up? <laughs> we just, and now I want everybody to stand up. Everybody. I get asked this question when I'm in, in all sorts of the world. Why is it that y'all have so much trouble with race in America? And I tell them, you don't understand. But what I do tell them is, if you're from the United States, we're all African American. We have a history of a certain type, of a certain background. If you don't own that, being in America, then you don't understand how we're all different and how we're all the same. And so when Candy brought that up, we can have a long conversation, Candy and I, about what it means to say, I am African American. But I am African American because it's my history, this is my country. So the same question comes when we talk about the Me Too movement. Who are women in this room? And that's the way we should always think. We're all standing, because we are all women, because that is our history, that's who we are. That's who we are as, as a human race. So that question that she brought up and having us all stand, I think is very, very appropriate for this. Thank you all for standing there. Uh, actually, still stay standing, because uh, I want to move into something else. Uh, so th I just want to make those quick sort of comments about the obvious thing in the room that we need, that we need to talk about since we're, we're talking about news. Now I want to do something that Professor Amy Cuddy always does. You all have done that before? The roar? Okay, so just put your hands up there like you're bare. Uh, those of you who've seen me do this before, I'm sorry, you have to do it again. <laughs> and your feet apart, equal distance to your shoulder or greater. 
And then you, you roar. Ah! One more time. Ah! One more time. Ah! Okay, what that does is it actually reduces the cortisol, which makes you nervous, and increases testosterone, which gives you more performance enhancement. So this supposedly, <laughs> if you do this for two months, uh, two hours, uh, excuse me, 20 minutes, oh, I'm, of course I'm joking. If you do this for a couple, you can sit down. If you do this for several minutes, even if you're not roaring, she swabbed cheeks of individuals that did this power pose, or when you're sitting at the table, if you even sit like in the anchor pose, it, it actually does that. Reduces cortisol, increases testosterone, and therefore you do better in your interviews, you feel stronger. Uh, and the reason why I want you to feel stronger in, in the moments I've got left is I did want to talk about, okay, so this is great, right? We're, we're, this is the watershed moment. Then we have to go into how do you tell the stories I was talking about, a difference in, in sameness, right? Either your own or others. And I, I'm not gonna take credit for any of these tips that I'm about to go through. They are from when I joined 30 Rock, uh, a group of producers that used to work for Tom Brokaw, who were especially powerful. And I, we talk about this watershed moment. It, s some say it's because women are woke. Women are woke, they've always been woke, <laughs> right? As Joanne Reed likes to say, they're woke. But it's also because men are woke now. And that's why it's so important. I forgot to mention it. Men are woke, but women have always been woke. And when they're woke together, guess what happens? We get this special place we're in. And the way we're gonna share our wokeness is by telling our stories. So let me go to the, let me get my, my clicker here real fast. And so when we're telling stories, I think that this is the obvious one, is knowing our audience. The person you're standing in front of when you tell your story is different all the time. And, and, and Nielsen, as much as it, many folks use it, it is like 1960s stuff, right? The amount of data coming into either our little cable boxes or Twitter tells us a lot about when and how and where, what we're doing. So think about when you're talking about two folks, you know, how do they talk to other folks? How do they, what, what are the things they like? How do, how do they or what do they believe in? Don't think about their age, because that whole idea of, uh, who's, who's a millennial in here? Don't you hate when you hear millennials? <laughs> I, I hate it, and that's, I have to correct people, and I say, no, we're living in a millennial age. It's not millennials, this is a millennial age. <laughs> and the millennial age is the thing I was talking about. We all adopt it regardless of our age. And I went, I'll go back to that again, anything, anytime, anywhere, and we're benefiting from that. Second thing is, um, tell a three-year story when you're thinking of stories. This is for you when you're putting on your business hat. What's the story that you will be for the next three years? I do this, I write down what I'm gonna be for three years. And then I figure out the sub-stories below that. All right, what are the three stories below that that empower me to be who I am? Or that empower that three-year story? What happens is we react very much to our career opportunities uh, because it's right in front of us as opposed to having that strategy. So write your three-year story, then write the three one-year stories that support that and so you can accomplish that. And then below that, guess what, of course, rules of three here. Then write your three trimester stories that support your one-year story. This works for not only our personal branding and our personal development and our personal storytelling, it obviously works in business strategy too. When you are telling your story, where are you from? What do you normally say? Anybody have an example for me? Where are you from? Go ahead, go for it. Chicago. Chicago. Mm -hmm. So next time, don't say Chicago. Tell me a story about where you're from. Where are you from? Uh, I grew up in a family with a pastor and a school teacher. That's where I'm from. Um, I grew up falling asleep in the pews. That's where I'm from. And I'm trying to think of pictures. So that I'm sharing a picture with you. So in your stories where it's about yourself or others, lead with the best pictures in your brain, not Chicago. I have trouble doing that too. But it's, it, this is the way we tell stories about ourselves as well as for our businesses. And I have this picture up here obviously because of the, the treachery that war can bring. And I, they led with the best picture of this girl running through the streets. So always think about leading with your best pictures. That's what we do when we're telling stories at M MSNBC and NBC. And think visually, say, 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 say is what I have been taught um, it, it, when you're writing and you're talking. Uh, again, this is about telling your story. Think about what you're providing, either in your slides uh, or what 
look, the way you look, say, see, see, say, and that will help you tell better stories. And um, use your pictures. Uh, I take horrible pictures, but I still use my own pictures. Uh, this is not obviously me taking it, uh, <laughs> but, but, it, it but it is my picture as opposed to using a stock photo um, with a lot of touch up. Um, and, and get the facts right, and this is especially during the time of um, fakery, um, because people believe that. Yeah, I know. Ugh. Um, people, one in three business merchants, they can't even get their, their, their listings right, their names right. And this is a breakdown by industry of how bad it is. <laughs> it costs money, 10 billion bucks. Um, and guess what? Because we have fake news around, it's not too far from fake business, right? Uh, it hasn't been aimed at business yet, but business will feel that. The, the one thing that's interesting is you'll notice here, and I, I like this factoid, is the trust and confidence in small business versus big business. And so when you're thinking about your, who you work for in your firm, whether it's large or small, is try to tell small stories. You don't want to be known as Stark Industries, right? Um, <laughs> stretch and dream uh, when you're telling stories. I, 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 I like to dream about stuff. Uh, when you're, well, I talk about the three-year story, don't be afraid to stretch, um, I, even though it may be based in facts. Create that running hypothesis of who you can be. 20% uh, of the story I always like to add in is my hope stuff. And, and if anybody, any of you are followers of the Pareto Principle, 20% always needs to be something else. And so for me, it's stretching and dreaming. Um, and of course, be inspirational, but don't be cocky. Um, but if, you're, if, if we don't stretch, if, we don't, if we're not confident, it doesn't work out well. Uh, it, and this is where I really get into the nitty gritty. Uh, find muscular verbs. So in your writing, in your tweets, in your emails, what I mean by muscular verbs, uh, things that connote action. I have some examples at the bottom there, punch, quench, cut, wrestle. Those happen to be my favorite or some of my favorite verbs. And there was a study at the University of Pennsylvania at Penn, and they looked at what's supposedly good writing and bad writing, and they found that good writing, uh, as you can see here, had more verbs Bad writing had fewer verbs, uh, and bad writing had more adjectives. So move away from overly leaning on passive verb structures like Jane was seen by me, going back to the Me Too movement, it, and the way we would talk about gender inequality um, and victim blaming. It used to be uh, Jane was raped. Uh, now we're in a moment where we're saying, no, John raped Jane. We're now in a moment where we're, we're going on the actors of sexual assault, the actors of sexual harassment. This passive verb structure that's dominated our discussion of sexual assault and harassment is now gone. We're focusing now on the subject, right? This person sexually harassed, this person sexually assaulted, and that is relevant to the passive verb structure as well as the moment that we're living in. Um, and don't lean on those long nouns and adjectives I'm talk I was talking about. Uh, any scientists in here, by the way, this word on the left? It is uh, <laughs> titan. It is the longest protein known to man. Um, and that's a long, long, long word that makes you sound like you're really smart for any of you chemists out there uh, that like the, the biggest protein in the world. Anybody a lover of the biggest protein in the world? Good, don't use long words. Uh, that's the point. Uh, be poetic. Enumerate your points in three. Um, the most popular number in nature is three. Uh, think cadence, parallelism, stages, and reveals in your storytelling. Reveal stuff. Um, it, you, you know who this person is, right? Yeah. Maya is a, an amazing uh, writer. She, she's so inspirational, even though we don't have her anymore. Think about that. Any readers of poetry in here? Great. Move that into your writing. I remember writing one story about Martin Luther King, and it was tough because you know we do, every year we're, we're trying to say, okay, what can we tell new about Martin Luther King? And I was really, really puzzled about how it would finish it. And I uh, wrote th the last three lines, and it showed a picture of him. Because he spoke at a lot of churches. And he was talking about how he might not live forever. He might not live long. And he was not afraid of dying. And I sh I, the next day, he was, uh, he, 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 he was, yeah, he was taken away. He was assassinated. But he said this very statement the day before. I, I may be killed, I may be murdered, but I need to keep on fighting. 
So we played that in this story of him saying that. We froze the picture, and then I struggled with the next lines, and I wrote, he was murdered the next day. He did not live long, but his idea of America does. And I, str I was, and me and my producers, and those three lines are so important to me because I worked on them, and it was, you can see there was a little bit of cadence in there, not, not sort of like these rhyming couplets. So think about that. Think about how you can be inspired by Maya and others in your writing. Don't be afraid, even in business writing. Totally cool, totally cool. And read out loud, totally cool. You may be you know, really uh, weirded out by somebody next to you talking out loud, but w that's what we do as journalists. When we're writing our broadcast journals, we'll say it out loud as we're, we're reading. You can hear it instantly, the cadence. You can hear it and you just, you'll put in a new muscular verb. You put in something new that'll really jazz you up. Um, by the way, short phrases. Uh, the ideal length, according to Penn here, is 15 to 20 words, 25 to 33 syllables. My mom always tells me, keep it simple, stupid, kiss. Um, and think, of, think like a boxer when you're, when you're writing. Jab, 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 uppercut. Jab, 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 uppercut. Um, so you don't need to pull it all out in these long sentences. Jab, 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 uppercut. And then porpoise. Yeah, that means sometimes you're talking at 50,000 feet, sometimes they give you a detail, give you a little nugget. Some of us will like to tell our stories by giving you fact after fact after fact. Porpoise, go high, then go low, go high, then go low. Uh, speaking of facts, they don't tell the story by themselves. Um, uh, when you do bring up facts, talk about them really simply. Um, and think of the story, then the fact sometimes. That's what we'll do. We'll consider a story, and then is there a fact that fills that in? And w with your quotes, with, with experts, you know, don't quote them because of their numbers. Quote them because of their, their emotion and passion. The scientists or chemists that I will quote is when they go, wow. Whew. That's what we'll use on TV. And then we'll say, he's just reacting to this new protein that they discovered. Because <laughs> isn't that fun? Because he goes, whoo, wow. So do that, uh, use the actual quotes of emotion like I just, uh, when I'm interviewing people, I'll say, give me a sound that, 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 that you feel when you hear of this idea. Like, give me a sound when you hear about the Me Too movement. Ugh. Give me a sound. Uh. Yeah, is what I'm thinking. So you do that in your interviews too sometimes. Just go, hey, what's the sound that, re that summarizes that? and keep them short and, but impactful. And uh, as we move to the end of this, story uh, storytelling done well is like a mini movie. Don't be afraid to spend <laughs> days and hours on it. Uh, we, when we do our stories, we do think about mini movies. This is what we try to do. Every word counts. Uh, and invest more time than you think you have. And just an example of that, as I finish up here, is The Avengers, which is one of my favorite movies. Two million dollars a minute. It's an expensive thing to do. That's what we do the same thing. Do that for your stories. For your stories when you're sitting across from somebody. When you go into the interview. When you have to stand up in front and talk to other people. Spend the same amount of time. It's worth it. Even if you can't use a script. Um, and then finally, think about this. Know when to say nothing. Right? Because sometimes nothing is so powerful. Me too. So that's storytelling.